In this session, we're going to look at the resurrection. So, what is a resurrection? After his death, Jesus' body lay in the grave for three days. Matthew 12, verse 40 tells us that. And after this period of time, in accordance with what he had prophesied, in John 2, verse 19, he rose from the dead. John chapter 2, verse 19 tells us, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, he's speaking of the temple of his body, and in three days I will raise it up. So he rose from the dead. This resurrection of ra or raising of Jesus' dead body to life again was through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8 verse 11 it says, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And what Jesus did was he declared before all men that he was the Son of God. Romans uh, 1 and verse 4. What it does, the resurrection that is, it shows us the defeat of man's greatest enemy. And uh, our greatest enemy, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 26 tells us that their last enemy which shall be destroyed is death. Many people live in a fear of death and the reason they live in fear of death is because they do not know what is beyond the grave or if anything. And many people deny, well, you know, you come, you live, you pay your taxes and you die. That's it. There is no afterlife. But Jesus defied uh, death in the sense that he was raised again from the dead. And as such, he promises a resurrection of our own mortal bodies. So why was Jesus raised from the dead, you might ask? Well, firstly, it was to make us a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. So, you know, this old man has been destroyed and a new man, speaking of the inner man, has as a result come to life through belief in Jesus and his resurrection. So the Bible says, I, I'm a new creation, I'm a new man. Uh, the second thing is, he was raised from the dead to give us new life. And we can read that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. So there's a number of th scriptures that I'm going to give you. In fact, uh, a lot of scriptures in this passage um, in this session today. So another reason that Jesus was raised from the dead was to give us hope. We we all need to live in hope. And in, you know, a lot of people live without hope in this world. And it's horrible to live without any hope, without any thought of there being a future. And 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, the scripture says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And if you want to look at another scripture there in relation to that, I would recommend to you uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 18 to 19. Another reason he was raised from the dead is to make us a son and joint heir in his kingdom. How good is that? He wants us to rule and reign with him uh, in his kingdom, the kingdom that he will establish when he returns. And in our, our session before this, we were talking about his second coming, and I might refer you to that. So what is this joint heirship? What scriptures teach us about this? Well, Romans 8 verses 15 to 17. And let's have a look at that. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together and it's implied with him. 
So another reason Jesus was raised from the dead is to deliver us from spiritual death. And, you know, people don't realize that death is at work within them, just not a physical death, but a spiritual death as well. You see, when we come to know Christ as our Lord and our Savior and receive Him as such, our spirits are revitalized. It's an activity of His Spirit upon our spirit, and it leads us to a place of understanding and of revelation of who God is and what He's done for, for us. And so let me refer you to a scripture there, Romans 6, um, verse 4 verse, and verse 13. And there it says, Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And, and do not present, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. It's talking about the members of our body and, and the implication, if you read this in the original language, is very simply that our, our members are, the Greek the word there, hooplon, uh, is actually talking about something which is actively used in, in a sense of war. It's a weapon of war. Uh, and so we, we understand that we are in a battle and we're in a battle for the revival of our spirits. And, and so in actual fact, uh, when it's talking about a burial in that passage, it's talking about the post uh, acceptance of Christ as Lord and Saviour and our testimony that the old man has been buried, which we signify through water baptism. Another reason that Jesus was raised from the dead is to give us victory over Satan. And there's a raft of scriptures that we could look at here. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 18 to 22, Mark 16, 16 and 17 and 1 John 4 and verse 4 and 1 John 5 verses 4 to 5. But let's just look, shall we, at Mark 16, 16 to 17. And the scripture says there, But when Herod heard, he said, This is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting passage, that. So... Let us uh, go on from here. We've seen a number of uh, reasons and, and probably there's one more that we just need to look at and that's to give us authority over Satan. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22, it's very clear that the resurrection of Jesus has given us power over Satan. So let's read this, shall we? Uh, 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered uh, once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to Christ, being put to death in the flesh and made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers, having been made subject to him. Very, 
very interesting passage of scripture that shows us very clearly that we have this God-given authority. So what is unique about the resurrection of Jesus? Well, Jesus, the scripture says, is the first fruits of those resurrected from the dead in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. And as such, he's the only living person that we can certainly declare did not die again after his resurrection. There were a number of people resurrected. Jesus resurrected people in his day. And the Old Testament tells us of both Elijah and Elisha who resurrected the dead. So, but those people, they died again after their resurrections. Now, the thing is that Jesus, on his resurrection, 40 days later, in actual fact, ascended into heaven. And because he is the Son of God, he's made it very clear to us that he lives and abides forever because he's seated at the right hand of the Father, evermore to make intercession for us. So the Bible, as I've said, records many instances where people were resurrected from the dead by those who served God. But all of these died again. In the Old Testament, for instance, for instance, we read of the Shunammite son, and I'll just give you a couple of references here, in 2 Kings 4, verses 32 to 37, the Moabite man in 2 Kings 13, 20 to 21. And then in the New Testament, we see a raft of people, Jairus' daughter in Matthew 9, 18 to 26, Jesus himself in Mark 16, verse 6. Then there was the widow of Nain's son, uh, Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 15. There was Lazarus at Bethany, and uh, Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. He was resurrected on the fourth day by Jesus. And we read of that in John chapter 11, verses 1 to 44. There was Dorcas, who was raised by Peter in Acts 9, verses 36 to 42. So we also read in the scriptures of the previous saints buried at Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' resurrection. And, and we read of this in Matthew 27, verses 51 to 30, 53. And what happened there, at Jesus' resurrection, certain saints in Jerusalem, they were resurrected from the dead. They came out of the graves. But all those ones died again at their resurrection because their resurrection was not to eternal life. But there is coming a resurrection for us all, which is unto eternal life, which is like Jesus' resurrection. And this is what has been promised to us. So how are we to understand the resurrection? The resurrection in the Old Testament is associated with the messianic hope of the day of the Lord. And let, let's have a look at a couple of scriptures here. Um, yeah, Daniel uh, 12, uh, Verses 1 and 2. And the scripture says this, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the resurrection then is seen as a, an event subsequent to the time of trouble um, and a time of desolation that Daniel speaks of. And if we, we are careful and if we look at some of the passages that Jesus gave us in relation to the signs of those coming, it is certainly a time of great desolation. In Isaiah, the resurrection is also seen during this time of great trouble. And we read of that in Isaiah 26, verses 19 to 21. The Gospel of John associates the resurrection as the hope associated with the last day as the day of the Lord in John 11:24 we understand then that the resurrection will occur, 
will occur at a time of great calamity upon the earth and is associated with the second coming of Jesus. So we look forward to that day. So there are different kinds of resurrection and, and that's possibly something that we should look at because Jesus clearly taught resurrection from the grave as both for both the righteous and the wicked. And so in John 5:28 and 29, the Bible tells us to marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Paul taught the same thing in Acts 24, 15 and in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Paul says this, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. The above scriptures clearly show us that there is a resurrection of all the dead. If we were not to look at any further in scripture, at anything else pertinent to this, we would think this resur resurrection to be of both the righteous and the wicked together. However, Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 to 6 talks about a first resurrection of the dead who reign with Christ for a thousand years over which the second death has no part. So there is a division then in the raising of the dead that just before the wicked is also shown by these verses. So let's have a look at this. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 20 to 24, it says, every man in his own order. Now it's interesting because the word order here in the Greek uh, is a military expression meaning a brigade or a div division. So there are a there's a division when it's talking about every man in his own order. Paul actually gives the order. He says, Christ, that are the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. And then after that, he says, then comes the end. The scripture suggests two resurrections, one to life and one to damnation. And so let, let's look at this passage of scripture, shall we? In John chapter 5, verses 25 to 30. And there we read this. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now the words of Jesus, and very clearly we see the two resurrections of one group to life and of another group uh, to damnation. So there are two resurrections. The first is the resurrection of the just. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17 says, For the Lord himself will descend, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. You see, those dead in Christ are those who are partakers of the resurrection of the just, Luke 14, 14. And Luke 14, 14 says, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. The resurrection of the just is for those Christians who have been justified. 
This is the special resurrection Paul had in mind when he expressed the hope that he might attain to the resurrection from the dead. We read that in Philippians 3.11. And then he goes on and he says, and the resurrection of life, John 5 and 29. So there is this first resurrection of the just, and this resurrection is for the believer. And so we also read in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So this time of judgment is when the Lord comes. And 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5 makes this very clear. Therefore, the scripture says, Judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Well, the other resurrection, of course, we've said this too, was the resurrection of the wicked dead. And so it would appear that this occurs after the millennial reign of Christ. And uh, we read the, of the millennial reign of Revelation 20, verses 5 to 15, and of the judgment that awaits people there. At which time, the scripture tells us, the earth will be renovated by fire in 2 Peter 3, 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And so the wicked dead are raised, they're judged, the scripture tells us, according to their works in Revelation 20, 11 to 15, before the great white throne. So these are those who are raised to damnation. And we read of that uh, again in John 5, verses 28 to 29. Now, the resurrection, an actual fact, meets the need of every believer. And uh, it is our deliverance, for instance, from the past. Your old sinful life has been put to death on the cross with Jesus and buried with him in the grave. So when Jesus was raised to life again, you were raised with him, leaving behind your old life in Jesus' grave. And Romans 6, 4 to 11. And I'm sure many of you know this passage because if you were water baptized, very frequently this is a passage which is read. And Romans 6, 4 to 11 tells us this. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Interesting concept, isn't it? This is typical of our death. Uh, it's typical of our death to sin. And if we have done this with him, our old man, which is crucified with him, we shall understand that we shall no longer be slaves to sin. Why? Because our old body, old body's been dead. And then the scripture goes on and it says, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wow, how good is that? You know, our old man's dead. We're raised to a new life. 
as we identify with Christ through the waters of baptism. So his resurrection means it's our deliverance from the past as we follow him through the waters of baptism. It's also our power for the present. You know, we can now live a life of victory over sin and all Satan's attacks against us because Jesus is alive. He's given us the power of his spirit. And, you know, in Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 31, and uh, it says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? It's also our bright hope for the future. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Colossians 1.18 tells us, Jesus rose from the dead so that all who believe in him could be raised. One day he shall return. This time not as a baby, but as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the ruler of all creation. And this is the believer's hope. If you want some scriptures on that, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 17 to 23. Later on in that chapter 50 uh, to verses 57. And read also 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. There it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of of God and the dead and God will rise first then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and this we shall always be with the Lord therefore comfort one another with these words what great words of comfort thus we shall always be with the Lord therefore comfort one another with those words. So what kind of bodies will believers be resurrected with? The scripture says a body according to the will of God in 1 uh, Corinthians 15 58 but God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. A glorious body the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15 43 in the first part of that voice because it's sown in dishonor it is raised in glory it is sown in weakness and it's raised in power so it's also a spiritual body in 1 Corinthians 15 44 it is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body we also see it's a powerful body in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 43, in the last part of that verse, for it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is also an incorruptible and an immortal body. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 and 49, and Philippians 3, uh, 21, and some of those scriptures we've looked at already. So Christ's resurrected body what of that the scripture tells us that it was his own body however a body different to ours for its life was no longer in the blood but by the power of god so we we understand that there is something that is quite unique and that there is something quite different about our body and so we read in in luke 24 verses 36 to 40 now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they'd seen a spirit. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. I mean, how fantastic is that, you know? And this is the type of body we're going to be raised with, just like the body that Jesus himself had when he was resurrected from the dead. And there's some other passages of scriptures 
that you might like to read in this regard. John chapter 2 verses 19 to 22, chapter 20 verses 26 to 29, Luke chapter 23 verse 55, and Luke chapter 24 verse 3. So then, we need to just understand that our physical body will be just like Jesus' body. And it's, it's interesting because it tells us that he will transform, transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the work by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So what a wonderful resurrection it's going to be. We'll have a body like his and we will live eternally. We will live with him. We will rule and reign with him because there is a resurrection that awaits all those uh, who believe to eternal life and to eternal peace and to enjoy the presence of God forever. So just be blessed today. Amen. There is something that's awaiting you that's good and it's wholesome, and it's all of God. So God bless you.